It all ended in Piccadilly on April the 8th, 2013. After two decades of physical and mental decline, Margaret Thatcher suffered a fatal stroke in the suite at the Ritz where she'd been living out what everyone involved knew would be her last days. The nation immediately went into mourning. While flags flew at half-mast at Buckingham Palace and the Houses of Parliament, the streets of places like Liverpool, Glasgow and Brixton flowed with ale and celebration. A certain song from the Wizard of Oz soundtrack zoomed up the charts. Parliament was recalled for a day of glowing, lip-trembling tributes, only briefly spoiled by Glenda Jackson being honest. The country was as divided over her in death as it had been in life. Why did they love her? Why did we hate her? Even after six years without her, Thatcher's legacy still haunts Britain. On the day that Margaret Thatcher died! I know that he has difficult negotiations at Maastricht and therefore needs our support in making those negotiations. And I, for one, am very grateful for the option. Not yet. Done. <laughs> Thatcher barely showed her face in the Commons after her ousting, devoting most of the remaining 18 months of the parliamentary term to running Finchley. Come the next election, she stepped down as MP and, as has been customary for a British Prime Minister, was immediately elevated to the Upper House as the first and last Baroness Thatcher of Kestedon, which naturally came with its own coat of arms, which she designed herself. It included the usual symbols for a former MP and Prime Minister, ultimately supported on either side by an Admiral of the Royal Navy, representing the glorious victory over the Argies, and Sir Isaac Newton, on the grounds that she used to be a scientist. Milton Friedman might have been a good choice there as well, but of course she'd repudiated ever having followed him or his philosophy of monetarism while still Prime Minister, when it became politically expedient to do so. She spent a lot more time in the Lords than she had in the Commons post-premiership, and she spent most of her time there yelling, moaning, or grumbling about her successor, John Major, and his despicable habit of negotiating with Europe. When, after a Herculean effort, the Maastricht Treaty was finally ratified and the EEC became the EU, all she could do was shake her head at how wrong everything had gone already. Fortunately, she had other jobs to go to outside of politics. Shortly after her elevation, she was hired by Philip Morris, the world's biggest tobacco company, who no doubt recognised the utility of one of the greatest spokespeople for evil alive at the time. As geopolitical consultant, she commanded a fee of a quarter of a million pounds a year, plus another quarter of a million for the newly founded Margaret Thatcher Foundation, and 50 grand every time she made a speech on their behalf. She didn't smoke, although Dennis did, but as usual for her, this was about freedom. In this case, the freedom for Philip Morris to advertise Marlboro's, Chesterfields and Benson and Hedges without having the government step in on the flimsy grounds that the products are literally poison and do nothing except kill. She also had books to write. Two breeze block sized volumes of memoirs focusing on her premiership and her life beforehand, in that order, which bunged up the bestseller list for most of the decade, and an equally large collection of essays on her theories of geopolitics called Statecraft, which didn't sell quite as well. 
and when little mass murdering fascist dictator Augusto Pinochet was discovered hiding in London, she immediately leapt to his defence. Senator Pinochet was a staunch friend of Britain throughout the Falklands War. His reward from this government was to be held prisoner for 16 months. Now, in the meantime, his health has been broken, the reputation of our courts has been tarnished, and vast sums of public money have been squandered on a political vendetta. Which was a major contributing factor to the bastard eventually getting away with it. That and Jack Straw's gullibility. By the time of Pinochet's El General I Can Walk miracle in 2000, Thatcher was quite ill. She already had her first small stroke in the mid-90s. By 2002, she'd had at least one major one and been forced to retire from public speaking. She lost Dennis to pancreatic cancer in 2003 and never truly recovered. Though she could occasionally be seen tottering around at various public functions and memorial services, most notably appearing in person at Reagan's funeral out of sheer determination. It was against doctor's orders, but since when did she take orders from anyone? Even then she was unable to give her eulogy in person, instead watching herself deliver it on video, which probably didn't help her increasing mental confusion as stroke after stroke systematically disintegrated parts of her brain. By the time the 2010s rolled around, she rarely left her home, being looked after by her kids. Well, Carol. Mark was too busy trying to overthrow random African democracies for cash. Her daughter reportedly had to keep reminding her that Dennis wasn't sitting right next to her. This is a sad thing to happen to anyone, even Thatcher. By the time she died, her inability to climb stairs had seen her move into a suite in the Ritz Hotel. But there's a good chance she didn't know that. Fortunately, the moment had been prepared for, with plans first drawn up for her funeral in 2009, when she still had enough of her marbles to be consulted on the subject. She herself turned down a state funeral on the grounds that it was more trouble than it was worth, and instead got a ceremonial one, with military honours due to being a former head of government. But Of course, there were plenty of people around who would have been happy if she'd just been hurled into a skip. Never mind the politics. Everyone can see, and everybody knows, that this party is The death. death parties that erupted in the more working-class areas of the country were immediately seized on by the likes of the Sun and the Mail as proof that the lower classes were no better than animals. Depraved, sickening, and thoroughly disobedient. It's worth remembering that these were essentially the same people who cheered when the Belgrano went down. Not that holding a street party to celebrate the death of anyone is anything other than ghoulish at best. It was creepy and distasteful two years earlier with Osama Bin Laden. If anything, it was even more so when it was Margaret Thatcher. However, in both cases, we can understand it. We're not directly comparing Thatcher to Bin Laden, of course. Mass slaughter and politics are completely different businesses, even if they broadly occupy the same sector. But through their works, both engendered similar amounts of rage. Bin Laden did it much more quickly and efficiently by simply murdering 3,000 people in one day. Thatcher took more than a decade to transform Britain into something glossier and with a larger presence on the world stage, but also harsher, more expensive to live in and blithely unconcerned about the quality of life of anyone below the middle income bracket. She didn't slaughter thousands, but millions of people were hurt in the slipstream of her great revolution. A revolution that benefited far fewer than it harmed, and it could be argued was intended to. Water, electricity, gas. These things aren't ours anymore. 
and yet we still need them to live, particularly water. That hasn't changed. The necessity of these things to keep society functioning, and its population alive for that matter, is as true now as it was 40 years ago, if not more so in the case of electricity. And then Thatcher and her economic revolution took them away from us and made them businesses instead of services. The big difference being that a business has at least one extra and overriding priority, the bottom line. Suddenly they have to balance the quality of their product against the possibility of making a profit. And of course profit was a factor before, services running at a loss is never good for the government. But it's also something that could be made up for in the annual budget if the services are important enough. It's not immediate life or death as it is in the private sector. And there's much less incentive to either hike prices up to ridiculous levels or to compromise on things like quality or basic health and safety. The public sector lacks that other magic ingredient that Thatcher considered so important. Competition. The red line is still an enemy to a nationalised company, but the private sector provides almost countless others in the shape of everyone else in the same industry. The theory is that competition provides an incentive to succeed, and obviously, and obviously the only way to succeed is to be demonstrably better than the rest. Right? Then the customers will come to you and your rivals, who aren't good enough, will have to improve or die. It's positively Darwinian. The survival of the fittest. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in the real world because there's a thing called advertising, which completely distorts this theoretical model out of shape. If merely being technically superior was enough to secure victory, we'd all have been watching Betamax instead of VHS and wearing slankets instead of Snuggies. So how many choices do you really have? Only one. Sony Betamax, a sharper picture. It's possible for an inferior but essentially good enough product to sell itself to the customer more successfully than a much better one. So much so that the superior product dies out and the invisible hand of the free market has decidedly not acted in favour of quality. And that's just at the point of sale. There's even more opportunities during the manufacturing process itself to cut corners, lowering production costs and increasing profits that way. It might make the products a bit worse, a bit shoddier, but there are always ways to sell them nonetheless. Besides, if they were perfect, they may never need replacing, so how are you going to sell more? So no, unregulated capitalism doesn't guarantee better products, let alone better public services. If anything, the lack of regulation and the lack of oversight makes them worse. And when you're talking about the necessities of life, like water and electricity, it starts to seem almost criminal even to bring them into this system especially where water is concerned, which is both literally necessary to live and almost entirely immune to competition. You can always switch to a different electricity company. Water comes from one place and one place only. Eventually you end up with things like the Deepwater Horizon disaster, which was largely caused by BP constantly choosing the cheapest option, both in fitting a blowout preventer in the first place and then in repairing it when it inevitably broke. Not that we're inclined to blame Margaret Thatcher for everything bad in the entire world. Reagan championed the same economic philosophy after all. Before Thatcher, we still thought there was such a thing as society, in the sense of it being something made of us, bigger than us and dependent on us. She disabused us of that nation. There are individual men and women, and there are families. And your duty is to look out for yourself, first and foremost. And as long as absolutely everyone else in the world, or at least the country, is doing the same thing, it should all go like clockwork. A society of individuals all acting in enlightened self-interest, clothed and fed by corporations doing likewise, all following the golden rule 
of doing unto others as you would have them do to you. And thus do we all reap the greater benefits that come from acting good rather than evil. Essentially, the entire world running on the honour system. It's a nice vision, but as the man said, there's one major and largely insoluble problem with it. It's bollocks. For a start, what Thatcher advocated isn't proper enlightened self-interest. It's closer to Ayn Rand's thinking, placing the self above all and benefiting society, or whatever, as a side effect, if at all. And besides, the harsh truth is that companies don't do better by being good. If all you want is to make money, evil is usually the most efficient choice. The Enron Corporation was essentially founded on this principle and its entire history stands as proof of its validity. They were formed just as Reagan was deregulating absolutely everything. Without him and that policy, they would never have been able to manufacture an artificial power shortage in California in order to push up profits. Their only mistake was getting caught. People died in the ensuing power crisis. Again, I acknowledge this isn't directly connected to Thatcher, but it's a product of the philosophy she pushed until it was such a fact of life, even the Labour Party accepted it as immutable. Not unconnected with this vision of society, or perhaps unsociety, is the dismantling of the welfare state. In 1982, she stated that the NHS was safe in the Conservative Party's hands. At the exact same time, she and Geoffrey Howe were working on plans to dismantle it, along with the rest of the social security apparatus. Fortunately, the plans proved hard enough to sell to the rest of the cabinet, let alone the country, and the idea was tabled in favour of transforming it gradually, with things like general management in place of consensus management, ultimately culminating in the creation, in Thatcher's last year, of the internal market, a soft privatisation that saw health authorities cease to run hospitals and instead forced them to purchase care services from newly formed NHS trusts, thereby bringing in competition. With the usual result. In this case, waiting times were cut down by reducing the quality of service. See also almost everything else she ever did. She did something similar to the BBC. She didn't manage to privatise it outright or even softly like she had the NHS, although she came within a hair. After a string of manufactured scandals over insidious left-wing bias, supporting evidence being anything Alan Bleasdale ever did, she managed to get the Director General Alastair Milne sacked and appointed an independent inquiry to, she hoped, give her the pretext to sell it off. Sadly for her, fortunately for everyone else, they recommended the retention of the licence fee. And although they did recommend selling off radios 1 and 2, that wouldn't have been the same if she'd had to let the plebs keep the rest of it. So the corporation survived Thatcher by the skin of its teeth, although there are definite parallels to be drawn between the NHS internal market and John Burt's bright idea of producer choice. And all these things, all their consequences, are still with us today. Our utilities are still PLCs, as are our communications and trains, although not our railway anymore, because having that in the private sector was literally killing far too many people. Most of them are following the same corporate model of charging us extortionate rates for service that's certainly no better and usually at least some degree worse than it was before privatisation. Thatcher's NHS reforms were just the start. Subsequently, more and more of it was sold, deregulated or revamped, including by the Labour government who introduced foundation hospitals, to the point where by now it's practically on its knees. The perfect pretext for the next Tory PM to finally kill it off. And then there's Brexit, and the ongoing national revolution pivoting around that, which is essentially Thatcher's pre-Maastricht policy on Europe finally fulfilled and gone mainstream. Britain first, last and always, foreigners know your place. So yes, I understand why there were death parties. I don't like or condone them, but I understand them. Thatcher's fans were too angry about the fact that they were happening at all to actually sit down and wonder why, to try and unpack the potential motivation 
behind such an action as this, dancing in the street to celebrate a frail old woman's death. Tasteless, undoubtedly. Completely impossible to justify? Pretty much, but far from impossible to explain. Many of those dancing that April were criticised for being too young to know what they were dancing about. They didn't live through Thatcher's Britain, after all. Even I, at the age of 36, have been scoffed at for my youthful presumption. But it's not true. I did live through Thatcher's Britain, and not just for the first seven and a half years of my life. I and everyone else born after 1979 have always lived in Thatcher's Britain. We never lived anywhere else. We live there now. Tomorrow belongs to me.